this is just about the, the mid-century modern houses in New Canaan, and I, I, uh, the book came out in uh, 2006. It's no longer in print, but I'm, I'm working on, on changing that. There, there, are, there are numerous modern enclaves uh, throughout the country, throughout the world, and mid-century enclaves, and I thought, uh, is there anything special about New Canaan? What, what happened there in that time? Was it just another modern enclave, or did anything significant happen there? If it was just another enclave, that's great, but if something unusual happened, I'd like to get that in, 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 the, over arc, in, the, in the arc of history, see where they fit in, basically. Um, and if they had any kind of contribution unique uh, to that time and place. So, first of all, the, 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 I want to put some faces with, with names. Some of these names you obviously know very well. Uh, Marcel Breuer, which of course was the architect of the Pirelli building, which Ron had just mentioned. Um, actually, he's, he's sitting on the, the terrace of the house in the, in the prior image, right? So he's playing chess on the, on this, on the terrace of this building. So even though he was not the architect, Elliot Noyes was the architect. But um, then the second face in name, I have uh, Landis Gores. Uh, Landis Gores was a bit, also a bit unique in the group that he emphasized his, uh, his, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was, was his mentor. And so he was really trying to blend the, the, the modern American uh, movement with the international style. And really no one was trying to do that at the time. So, so it's really more than just a stylistic blend, it's almost like a philosophical differences he was trying to resolve in, in his buildings. Uh, John Johansson, he was the, uh, he passed away not that long ago, he was the last uh, surviving one of the five. And if I had to kind of put him in a, in a nutshell, I'd say he was like the futurist of the group. He was always uh, looking to what was going to happen next. And up until late into his 80s, I think even into his 90s, he was publishing work. Uh, his last book was about nano architecture. He thought buildings could, could grow out of the ground by their own DNA. And this is a great, photo, a great photograph of, of course, Philip Johnson and Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, well, I'll get, I'll get more into those. Actually, there is a Frank Lloyd Wright building, a house in, in, in New Canaan. I believe there's only two houses of Wright in Connecticut uh, and, and Elliot Noyes. So well, I'm going to try to touch on everybody. I just put some faces with some names there, but I'm going to keep it moving. Oh, OK. So I'm starting with this. Now, this is obviously the, the international style, the book that Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock uh, wrote, and they came out in 1933. And I'm gonna basically bookend this, this presentation with books on either end. And I, I, uh, the books are often kind of guideposts in, in history. They're, they are history books uh, as soon as they're written, basically. And, and, I, and I see the work in New Canaan is happening between uh, the, the, these books. Now, Johnson, wrote this in 33, he wasn't an architect yet. In fact, he, when he went to architecture school at the GSD, his book was used as a textbook there. Can you imagine being a student and having your, and then for his thesis project, he builds a house in Cambridge with a butler. And so, you know, it's a different kind of student. But the, um, it's typical uh, spread of uh, pages inside the book, it's just photographs, Floor plans, very brief description. That's the body of the book, really. The, the Villa Savoy, uh, the Barcelona Pavilion. And for a lot of people, this would have been the first time they're seeing these buildings. So, jumping ahead now, almost 30 years. Almost, I mean, sorry, 20 years, 20 years. This is a, a uh, ticket from one of the modern day house tours. Now, this is not the first house tour, but <clears throat> I believe it's the second one. And they were using uh, these tours. They were, the money was being raised for charity, but there was a really a way to show off their work. And the, 
the, the magazines of the day also were a big part of how they were getting their work out there. And the magazines, for me, many years later, became a great resource to get the information on them. Now, I, I included this in my book, uh, although I was discouraged from including any kind of map in the book because they didn't want to make a tour guide out of it. They wanted to preserve the, the, the privacy of people who live in the homes. Um, this is what I found more often than not, it seemed like. Uh, this is probably early 2000 or so. And someone would say, oh, you're interested in those houses? I'll tell you, go down that street and take a left. You'll find one down there. And I would go and there'd be a bulldozer that day taking it down. And it seemed like nobody at the time really cared about these houses. And I felt, I felt like I was the only one who cared about these things. So I really felt this need to document them before more were lost. So we'll start with Marcel Breuer. Okay. It's Breuer's first house. He did two houses for himself in New Canaan. Now, Breuer had, of course, uh, been a student at the Bauhaus. He was a bit older than the other four of, of the five I've grouped together. Um, and then he, when he came to the, to the US, he was an instructor at the uh, GSD. So uh, he, he, again, really wasn't, uh, uh, he was more of a mentor to, to, to them. And here he is building his first house in New Canaan. Now, if his experience would have been mostly in masonry in Europe, and he comes to the US, and he's now building wood. So he's using wood almost in a, in a naive way, in a way, taking it, taking it from with no prior knowledge. And so he's taking the wood and he's using it for its cantilevering effect. Actually, you see the ends, see the ends of, that, of the house, the, the siding is diagonal on the ends to provide bracing. Because for, for it's cantilevered on both ends, cantilevered a small amount in the front, and then there's that, that, that wonderful deck that's cantilevered out, but also held with uh, cables. So there's a, it's a compact, efficient design which you'll see in most of them, of their, of their early homes are like this. They're, they're, they're uh, built for efficiency. And there you really get a sense of, of that cantilever. The, the children almost look threatened, I think, there, that weight above them. But, um, and that him and his wife, and it, looks, it looks so bucolic here and so rural, and it, it's still fairly rural. The house has changed now. There's been additions to the house, and the neighborhood's a little more developed now. So this is early Breuer. Actually, it's interesting. If you see somebody, there's a Calder mobile hanging there. Even in some of the artwork, if you look at, he's taking these things from his prior homes. Too. You see, if you look, research him, you know, the same furniture they brought along to the early homes. But, uh, um, and this, this profile, this, this photograph, almost became like shorthand for mo uh, mid-century modernism, that wonderful cantilever. Here we have a uh, uh, collaboration with Elliot Noyes and Marcel Breuer, 1949. Uh, much, much larger house, but still, um, um, this is an early kind of binuclear plan, what Marcel Breuer was known for. And binuclear plan really means the parents are on one side and the kids are on the other side. <laughs> the, um, and some, some very modest homes, too. Um, and I had this, uh, the PowerPoint presentation I brought somehow didn't load correctly, so I'm going with an older version, but in the, um, in the uh, one I had hoped to bring, um, I, I followed this up with uh, his later work. Now his later work, Marcel Breuer, was known more for um, like the Pirelli building and large institutional like the St. John's Abbey in Minnesota large concrete structures, which then opened the door to people like Rudolph and this building also that we're in. But Marcel Breuer built another house for himself, Breuer House Number 2, I call it, uh, which is really quite different than his first one. Here it's not trying to float above the ground. Here it's right on the ground, and he's using more of these long kind of uh, Connecticut fieldstone walls, and they're uh, arranged in this kind of, almost like a pinwheel uh, effect of these walls. Uh, this house has been uh, added on to substantially by Toshiko Mori. And 
I'm going to go to Elena Scores' house. This is uh, Elena Scores' house that uh, John had mentioned that I'm working with the, the current owners on restoring it. Uh, and, and you can see the, the, the obvious influence of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in this. Now, Linus Gores, when he designed this house, was, was in his 20s. And the detailing is so unique. You cannot assume anything with this, with this architect. Um, but for, for, for a young man in his 20s to get, it, you know, this is a fairly, fairly uh, significant home. It's, it's a fairly large home. Um, I, uh, I, I spoke with his, his wife, Pamela, is still around, and she tells me that um, th they came into an unexpected inheritance, and uh, they really weren't sure uh, what to do with this. And, and Philip Johnson said, well, of course you know what you're going to do. You're going to build your first house with this. And so that's what they did. They built this, and it was a place to, again, show off your work. But these, this the, the layers of things. You see that you see that, that, that cantilever over the door. And you see these other layers to conceive of, of this. It's something you wouldn't draw naturally, but when you're there, you can experience it. And, and these kind of very dramatic. This is not very light and airy and bright. This is more moody kind of architecture. With the goldfish pond there, and the, and the, the doors that go straight out to the back. This one uh, very large living room, very elegant, high-ceilinged room, which is not common to a lot of the mid-century moderns. They often had very low ceilings. The, the, the Asian painting on the uh, tapestry is still on the wall there to this day. The built-in furniture is still there to this day. I took this photograph, and the, uh, I asked uh, one of his daughters about these little cutouts. And she goes, well, don't you see? That's, a, that's an icon of the house itself. You see the little, those three vertical bars, like the three windows. Windows are always in triples in this house. And she, had, she understood right away, and she had to, she had to clue me in there. So uh, I'm just taking some fun shots here. Anyway, then later, this is much later, 1960. Now, this is the pool house uh, that, that John mentioned that we, uh, uh, we renovated recently. The, the town of New Canaan uh, bought this fairly large estate and, and, and to turn it into a park. And there was a, a main house, a, a carriage house, and this pool, and pool house. And they first filled the pool in for liability reasons, and they were going to knock down this structure. And a small group got together to try to save it, and, and they did. And, and, um, we, we renovated this building, but when we, and what's interesting about this is how different it is, say, from his, from his, uh, or his own house. Uh, you see the triple, win triple doors in the front, though, right? Right in the middle, those triple doors in the middle. But it's really a very kind of like more compact and more, a very classically arranged building. At the, the, the large, the tall center room in the middle, and these even wings on both sides. And this, this photograph, he, um, he had uh, polio uh, um, unexpectedly. You know, he was quite young, and he, but he got polio, and he was confined to a wheelchair and eventually to an iron lung. But he was still working uh, while in that wheelchair. And I was marveling at, the, at, the, uh, at that, because if you look at the plan, there are all these very narrow passageways. Look at the, where, these, where, the, where the doors are. And, and yet he was in a wheelchair when he designed the place. But the building was right on grade. You could, you could, just, you could just roll right in, basically, from grade. There looks like a ledge there now, but the, but the grade was brought up to it. And these fairly elegant sporting uh, photographs here. Um, these were, uh, I believe, by Robert DeMora, who was a photographer of these. And, but when we got there, the building didn't quite look like this. <laughs> and the, at, at this main room, the, uh, it has this wonderful, um, it's, it's redwood walls there, um, and this custom brick there. But we got there, look more like this. It was a bit overgrown. In fact, there was a small tree growing out of the chimney right there. And uh, the, 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 everything was pretty much failing at this point. It had been ignored, really, for decades, the building. So we. 
really, we had to, because uh, it was a town-owned building, um, the, the, the drawings had to go out for public uh, bid, and, and uh, we had to take the lowest bidder for the job kind of thing. And we had to do lead abatement to the building, and uh, the town had left us no, no source of power because they had pulled the oil tank uh, for the building. So here, here it is, the pool's filled in, there's no source of heat for this building. You know, this thing's almost a little orphan at this point. And so we, this is one of the changing rooms, bathrooms, uh, wings. And, uh, and we really had no program for this building even. We just, we just wanted to save it. But I, uh, here's the, the construction drawings. that documented every piece of stone on the floor, everything. And what we did was we, um, we, we vaulted the, the wings, which had been the changing rooms and bathrooms, and made them galleries. And there's little, uh, these little galleries. One wing is for the history of, of modern architecture in New Canaan, and the next wing could be whatever's happening next, whatever's happening new in art. And then the middle room was this, this period modern room. And so it's open to the public now. It pretty much follows the glass house uh, schedule. Uh, so visitors who come from out of town, visit the glass house, can visit this in, in Irwin Park. We put in geothermal heating and cooling. That's how we resolved the, the uh, heating and cooling requirement because we didn't have oil or, or any way to get fuel there, but we had electricity. And here we are gutting out the, uh, the wings. And I love this picture. The guy looks like he's half underground there. <laughs> and, and what was interesting was we, the, in, the, in, the, in the neighboring building, the main uh, building next door, the town had set up uh, offices, planning and zoning offices temporarily. And someone came to me and said, oh, we have drawings of that building you're working on. And I said, you know, well, you know, we, have, we, know the, we know how this is built. We have the drawings. And, and, and uh, she unrolls these drawings. And I'm like, well, that isn't the building. And I looked at it, and there was a whole set of construction drawings, but they were dated a year earlier. And it was a different design. And look at the design. It's an asymmetrical design, and, and it's a brick building. And, it, and, and in fact, there was some scrawl on, on one, some corners where they had tallied up the li list of costs. And you could say, oh, you, you can see what happened, right? The cost came in too high. And so they had to redesign it. And it's funny, when they redesigned it, they did it out of, out of wood, now instead of brick. But they also changed the overall feel of the building, right? Now it became more of this wooden, little wooden temple instead. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting find. Uh, so here we are, still renovating. We, we actually had to find some new brick to try to match the old brick to rebuild that chimney. And you know, even replacing broken stones out front and cutting them around the, the wood piers to fit. And, and, and here it is today. So it looks a little jazzier now. So it's called the Gore's Pavilion for the Arts in New Canaan. And uh, that was not my choice, but I think it's great that just like this building is named after its architect, that building is named after its architect also. Actually, a friend gave me this photograph, and I thought, oh, too bad. The, no, it looks kind of cool, those weeds there. It's kind of fun. So the, the, the middle room, the, some of the money that was raised with all private donations, uh, the one was from Jens Rizm, who was a uh, famous furniture designer out of New Canaan. So different you know, photographs of the interior there. All the wood, we, we sanded all the wood down by hand to make sure there were no circular sanding marks on, on the redwood. Anyway, so that's kind of what it looks like today. So he does these interned corners, you know, like just as he did on his, on his house many years earlier. He kind of pulls in the corners and then there's three big windows or doors in the front. And there's the gallery. So those were just the, the changing room bathrooms. And now that I just, we vaulted the ceiling up and we exposed the structure. So the structure was trusses. Every six feet was a truss built. You couldn't see it before. We exposed that. And the truss goes out to the columns that are out front. So those walls that you see carry no weight at all. In fact, the walls were only about an inch and a half thick when we got there. You could just move those walls with your hand. And I'm not sure why he went to such gymnastics to create this place, but he, like, he enjoyed it. He you know, enjoyed kind of pushing the envelope. So that little old building is now a gallery. So uh, on to John Johansson. Again, here's the early John Johansson. 
If you, this is his own house. It's a small house, right? You can see, look how fairly complicated it is. Uh, there's these large windows uh, that slide to open up. And there, see the wood paneling on the side there. One, one point, the wood paneling goes up to the ceiling. Another point, the wood paneling goes up to the transom windows there. There's a lot going on. There's little slot windows just above the grade there to let some light in. Or even under that step to that door, there's a slot window there. So you're getting a lot in in a small building. Uh, he was a rather uh, athletic type, and uh, I heard that when they, they, they had parties there, he would slide open that window and take a running leap out the window and spin in midair and land on his feet, just to kind of show off his uh, prowess there. Um, so this is, uh, here's, a, here's the kind of typical thing I would find, a magazine from 1952. You'd see a little bit of floor play and some photographs, would, and that's, that's how a lot of it was gathered, a lot of the information on these homes. And he did these series of, of hand sketches. Now this is a sketch for his own house. I'm not sure why he's doing a sketch for himself. And it's really hard to tell a whole lot from these sketches. And I, I actually have found these in the, um, the Avery Library at Columbia. And I brought these to him, his series of, of, of renderings. And he says, where'd you find those? I don't have those. So uh, I felt like I really found something. But then look at this, just a few years later, a house for a client. What's the difference here? Right? Look at this house compared to the house he did for himself. So simple, right? And so classically arranged. The door right in the middle. He had to have a door on the side there for the kitchen entry, but he tried to blend it in. The whole building looks like it's built out of steel, but it's not. Look, it's mimicking steel, the detailing and it's just floating above the ground there, but very serene and classical, not very complicated. And he did the, a whole series of these homes in New Canaan. They were basically squares. And he's playing this game with, the, with it, like shifting the pieces around in these squares. Sometimes they're courtyards and sometimes they're enclosed in. And here's these renderings where it's more mood than information maybe, but one after. But look at these, 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 these homes where it's like, a, it's like a square or a cross. He's pulled out, and look at the stairs. Look at the stairs going up on the side of this house. That's your entry into the house. Can you imagine bringing your groceries up that stair on, on a day like today? And, and look at the door. Look at that door. Imagine sliding open that door just to crawl, just to get in and out of the house. And see, so I had a whole series of these homes, and, and later, Later, he describes them as his Neo-Palladian series. So here are these, these, these fellows, right, who are trained in the, in, at the Graduate School of Design. Now, the, the importance of the, the Harvard Five is that Harvard was the first school to take on the Bauhaus teaching methodology. Everybody else was still Beaux-Arts. And so and these, when they came out of the school, these are the first graduates to then be unleashed. With, the, with his training. And they're taught what? They're taught to break the box, right? To break the classical box. Mm -hmm. And at first, they, they were. But then later, you see them going back. You see them embracing this very classical nature. Another of these cross houses, these monumental stairs. How do you sell these to clients? I don't know. <laughs> But then I found this house. Look, in 1923, this was a, a house built at the Bauhaus on their own property in Germany. The students were, built this. Even Breuer was involved, even. And look at the floor plan. <laughs> That's a modern house, 1923. Did they know about this? Look at the entrance right in the middle. In the middle, right in the front, in this big courtyard, in, the, in this big uh, center space. But what a neat center space, huh? So a lot of these homes somewhat looked like this. Was it just coincidence? I'm not sure. So here's another one of these homes. This straddles uh, a river. These four squares and this bridge. And he, he loved these romantic ideas of, well, you're, you're one person on this side of the river, and by the time you cross the other side of the river, you've had this experience, now you're a different person on the other side of the river. And, and, and 
And then, the, and then the detailing of this, look at the detailing of this. You have these low vaulted uh, arches here. And it's not what you think of when you think of these kind of complex, like the homes on the cover of the book, right? This kind of, it's not like that at all. These are very symmetrical houses, very, and, they're, and they're picking up classical references. Look at the gargoyles. See the gargoyles where the, the, the roofs drain onto those? And then the, the, the ceiling was gold leafed in the ceiling of, the, of these barrel vaults. And you have a terrazzo floor of rich materials. But at the same time, he was dreaming about this stuff. <laughs> and he's working with these organic, it's kind of snail-like uh, things. You, you picture they'd be like, like a pool, like you, you spray the pool uh, coat, coating on these things. And I don't think he had any of these built. Well, actually, he did have something close to this built. But, uh, but the clients wanted the classical stuff. So the funny thing about the glass house, I mean, there's a lot of funny things about it, but you look at this picture and you really don't see a lot, right? You, you see the, the lawn, you see the trees, and it's hard to even see the house. Well, obviously, right, obviously, in a way, it's glass. It's hard to see. But it's also, it's also dark. The, the frame is dark, right? So people say, people say oh, yes, he, he stole Mies van der Rohe's uh, idea for the Farnsworth house, right? But the two couldn't be any more different. The Farnsworth house was white and delicate and, 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 and was raised up out of the flood zone on these delicate pillow tea. And, and the, the pattern in the floor was the same proportion of the, as a, as a pattern. Everything met that same proportion in the building. Here, the floor is, is herringbone brick. It's more like a carpet. So he's doing these kind of decorative things. The detailing is not as graceful. Walk up to the building, look at the corners, look at the way it's put together. And you go, ooh, this is not as gracefully done. But how serene, how serene. So what, how does this, how does this get this serenity here? Well, for years, really, I had just looked at the floor plan. You see this in textbooks, you see the floor plan, primarily. And, if you, and as an architect, you start with the floor plan. And you look at this, and well, everything's kind of just floating there. You, you know, the, there's a bed, there's some furniture, there's that, there's that cylinder that has a fireplace and the bathroom in it. And it's more like a, a, a constructivist Russian painting or something, you're really kind of floating around. But the elevations are totally different. Look at the elevations are completely symmetrical. The front is the same as the back, and each side is exactly the same, and there's a door in the middle of each side. There's no operable windows, it's just the doors. So this building has a schizophrenic aspect about it. It's two things at once. You can look at that, or you can look at this. Which, which house is it? Now, when people say glass house, people in New Canaan say that, they mean the whole compound, right? The, the glass house, and if you say glass house, it's actually the brick guest house diagonally across from it. Now, the, the guest house is, of course, a solid and void discussion there, but it had all the mechanicals in it well, that had, couldn't be in the glass house, right? And the whole property becomes this whole diary of an eccentric architect. Every, every few years, he's building something different on it. He's got uh, uh, down by the, by the pond, there's a pavilion there, which is purely a, a, a study in arches, which look like the future of Lincoln Center there. there there's the, uh, the, the, the painting gallery and the sculpture gallery and, his, and then his, his library. So look, there's, there's that guest house, diagonally right across from the glass house. This is the solid and the void. But the inside, it's hard to figure out what's going on there in that plan, right? But look at the inside here. Who, in 1949, was doing this? These delicate arches. It's, it's just so, in the bed there, I mean, it's, the whole thing is so sensual, the whole thing, though. The, 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 there are windows in the back, but they're covered up with those curtains, the big, or these big round windows. Oh, I love this letter. This is a letter I, I found that uh, uh, Philip Johnson had, uh, the, the Glass House had just been published in the New York Times. And he writes to the uh, um, lady who had been there to see it. And uh, I like his, um, 
his third, his third sentence, his third paragraph there. I appreciate it especially that you did not try to make fun of the whole project, <laughs> which would have been such an easy thing to do. <laughs> And he, had, he did that, uh, that, that article that um, came out where he, he gives credit to everybody and anybody for, for all the work he's done. Like, oh, well, this, I was inspired by this Italian villa, and I was inspired by Mies van der Rohe, and I was inspired by cons Russian constructivist paintings. And, I was, and why are you doing that? Nobody was doing that. Everybody was kind of solitary Howard Rourke fountainhead figure at that point. And here is somebody doing the opposite of that. He's giving everybody else credit. Was it to give a, a, a foundation for his work? Was it to justify the work? Was it a, was it a sense of insecurity about the work? There's, there's that pavilion down by the way. It's a three-quarter scale. That is, you walk there and you hit your head. And you have to, the, there's the land above. You have to take a, take a little jump out to get there from the water. There's, there's uh, Lord Snowden visiting, doing that jump I just described. And uh, the place became the place to be, right? It became a place for celebrities and all to visit. The painting gallery, the idea was that sunlight was not good for paintings. So it would hide them from the sun. I think water is probably worse, though. <laughs> so, and then the, the building's arranged in this, in this, in this, in this, in this Rolodex on its side. And so, you, instead of getting the fatigue of walking around an art gallery, walking and walking and walking, no. You'd sit there and somebody would turn the, the paintings for you. And the, 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 the sculpture gallery. Um, this is a hard building to, to, to love, I think. Um, the plan is this cube with these, with these triangles jabbing into it there. Um, and then the building itself, you have there's these three enormous heaters, heaters hanging from the ceiling there, which will rattle the whole roof there. And then the, the grid of that roof would cast these cutting lines across all the sculpture. So when the sun comes out, when the sun, when the sun comes out, everything's sliced uh, with, with, with these lights. But in the, in the path just goes down to really nowhere at the bottom. So it's a building. I know you're not supposed to criticize the grades. I'm sorry, but the uh, I love this building. His little library, and it's the simplest building. So you've got books, a place to sit, a fireplace. That's it. There's no bathroom. There's no no way to eat. There's nothing. And you know, if you look at it, what does it look like? It looks like two people, doesn't it? It's like two people kind of embracing there. Um, and, uh, but there's the plan, right? The fireplace is in the upper right-hand corner, just books on the shelves, and then that, and then that, that rotunda room was a little oculus on top of the rotunda room. Mm. Again, look at the carpeting, so decorative, the carpeting. Unlike an architect, too decorative, right? This building, I actually saw this being built back in the day. This, he called this Damansta, and he was already planning for his future of this estate, and this was to be a visitor's center. So the place to start a tour of the property, there'd be a little presentation there perhaps, and, but that was not to be. The, the town did not want people arriving that way. Uh, so the visitor center is off site for, for the building. And very unlike his earlier work, much more, you know, almost anthropomorphic like. But for clients, Right, 1950, this is much earlier, 1953. Uh, this is the ball house. Um, now this looks like Miesian to me, the Miesian courtyard house. Very straightforward, and look at that, look at that plan. There's a, that, you see the terrace that goes up and down the page? It's just a, basically a cruciform plan, right? One is a, a solid material, and the other one is purely through the windows, it's that terrace. So it's again this solid and void kind of overcrossing each other right there. The Wiley, now this looks like his glass house on a stone pedestal in a way, right? Here's his glass house for a family to live in. And the bedrooms would be downstairs and the living space upstairs. He actually did this, uh, Landis Gores writes about this project, and they basically had designed this, and they were looking for a client for it. 
<laughs> Which doesn't seem like the way modern architecture is supposed to be, right? Modern architecture is supposed to be about, oh, we have been inspired by the site and the orientation and this, and no, they had already had this in their mind. Again, it's trying to look like steel, but it's, it's, it's wood frame. There's a lower level, all looks like a, like a basement living space for the most part, and on the upper level with that terrace. There's that great room. What a great room. Yeah. Again, a fairly early house. Now, the, the, this is right across the street from the glass house. But look at the main body of the house. It's very symmetrical, isn't it? You've got a, a courtyard in the middle, it's, but it's really just a, kind of a big cube again. And then, oh, we had to plan for more bedrooms. How do you do that? How do you add on to a perfect plan. Well, there's this hyphen. You had to kind of remove it, otherwise it would violate the main building. So that was designed really very soon after the main, main body of the house was designed. It's a, it's a very dramatic shot, only interrupted by the garden hose out front. And you see a shot of the courtyard there. So this is now mid-1950s. And this is a fairly large, luxur luxurious house. And I'm thinking, OK, the glass house for me was that turning point when they started thinking about classicism, when they started bringing in all of them, all brought in history back into their vocabulary. And I'm looking at this house going, mm, well, is this just a modern house? And what I was told was the owners had come to Johnson saying they wanted a Roman villa. Well, he would have eaten that up, right? Here's a, here's a historical idea. Well, how is this a Roman villa? Roman villas, what are they? They're really a gentleman farm, right? They're, 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 a, gentle, they're a country house. Um, but what were the Romans known for? Courtyards, right? You'd have courtyards in their homes. And Romans, of course, used brick. Well, he's got a, the whole building is brick, and it's full of all these courtyards, these interlocking courtyards. It's just a very simple grid. And yet, there's in and out spaces everywhere in this. And the brick, the first time I really saw this building, I thought, look at those piers. Those piers are so oversized, they're just holding up that pergola right there. Why are they so big? And you look very closely at the brick, and it's, oh, this again, it's a decorative thing. The brick is used because it's beautiful. But that center room is, is, it a, is this very striking room. Anyway, so now back a few years again. Here we are in early the noise first house. I imagine Fred must have spent early years here. And uh, I, you know, it's, I fall in love with these, these homes, though. See how it's located on the slope right here? On the street level, you walked in. There's stairs going down, but right away there's the bedrooms. And then the main living space was downstairs. Well, why would you have done that? Well, look, it, it flows down. The site flows down. And now most of, the, most of your time is going to be spent in the kitchen and downstairs in that family room space. And you're open right to the backyard. You can walk right out to the backyard. And then further down is this very pretty pond, idyllic. And you're hidden from the street down there. So that's just the street front. Barely a, barely a window on it, right? You get the, the, the front entry, but otherwise, we're very private. But look at the plan. The plan has this long retaining wall, and then all glassy up the page there, because that's where the, the lawn opened up. Is that there's a way to get out from the kitchen to a little courtyard there. The upstairs, all the bedrooms. And it's a wonderful but compact plan. Now, here's a house. This is more what I expected to find when I was looking at the modern houses in New Canaan. This fairly complicated looking, still very poised, still very balanced, but hard to understand at first. But just entertaining to look at, right? Look at the stair detail in this, how wonderful. And look how simple the materials are. You have concrete block there. That floor to ceiling glass. There's, there's the first floor plan and upper floor plan. Here, another one of these great, but look at, look at the year, 51. This is fairly early. 
This, this, this house, you got that, you got that, it's basically a two-story house, right? The first floor is stone, the second floor is wood. And then once it, the wood's one pulled forward and the wood one is pulled to the side. And now it's floating out there. And you, you park under that one, park under that point. So not only did he pull it forward and pull it to the side, and then off the back of that bedroom level, look at that viewing platform. Yes, it's awesome. <laughs> Wow, what a blast, what a blast. I took these photographs. The house was days away from demolition, just days away. And you know, I went there probably just a few days after this to take some more photographs, and they had already started demolition. And I went into the, the place was unlocked. I walked right inside. And on the walls, people had scrawled on the walls, this house is a joke. You know, so it wasn't enough just to knock it down. They had to insult it too, you know. It, but that, and some of that opinion, opinion still carries on in New Canaan. There's still some of that anxiety, but both some of that tension between the modernists and, and, and the townsfolk. Well, here's the, the first floor plan. And then the second floor plan. Get that great deck on the, on the side there. I even have, drew the elevations by hand. I don't know when I had time to do this. But. <laughs> but look at Noyes' second house for himself. Wait a minute, that first one was that wood compact one on the slope, right? It sounds like Breuer in a way, right? Remember that Breuer's first one has that delicate wood one kind of cantilevered out? Breuer's second one was that stone one with a shifting uh, pinwheel plan? Here's Noyes' second house. But it's not Breuer. You can barely see it in this photograph, except you can see the Thunderbird out front. But look at the floor plan. It's, it's not that shifting pinwheel stuff at all going on here. A long stone wall in the front, very dramatic. You walked in, boom, courtyard, right? The big courtyard. Bedrooms to one side, living space to the other. Super organized, right? But so classical, They're just timeless. There, there's the big, the big, the, these big wood, wood doors pocket open to the courtyard there. And yes, you have to walk outdoors. Under some covered, uh, under the cover there, but you walk outdoors between the bedrooms and the living space. And it's still there, it's still a wonderful house. Now, I can't show houses in, in New Canaan without a, also including Frank Lloyd Wright house. A very, a very late house uh, for Wright. And uh, it's, it's, it's still there. It's right on the, uh, on the Neroten River. And it's kind of what I call the football shape and plan there. And, uh, but look at the way it opens up to the river there. So it was originally a fairly compact house. It has since been enlarged uh, by the Tellies and has done the enlargements. Look at the shot across the river. That wonderful glow. And look again, they have a concrete block. Here they gold leafed the concrete block. <laughs> and then, now, John Black Lee. John Black Lee was not one of the Harvard Five, neither, neither was Frank Lloyd Wright. But he did three houses for himself in New, in New Canaan. I love this first one. Again, one of these compact early designs. And yet, look at, the, look at this elevation we're getting a peak of there through the trees. The two big windows flanking by those triple windows, right in the middle of the facade there. Hmm, so it's compact and it's modern, but it's not scattering windows all over the facade. It's organizing them very carefully. But look at this plan. Look at the core. See where the, the kitchen is, the, the bathroom, mechanical space? right in the middle there, and you can walk all the way around that space. It's a wonderful circulation, and, and that's where the foundation is, is just under that core. So all the rest is floating on piers of the house. But it's that core is really the kind of the same proportion as the rest of the house. Look at the, look at the scale of the sides to, to the side. It's the same as the rest of the house. And what a compact, what efficient plan. And, it's, and this house is still there. And sometimes 
this site has saved the house. Because this is a very rocky site. And this house is just perched on this incredible rock. And around it is this mossy grass. It's not a place to build your five bedroom colonial house. It is not. You know. But look out. Look at that. I mean, it's frightening, isn't it? I mean, it just, it's just in a wonderful way. Now, look at that. See the glass there on the right there, that room there? We'll come up to that room. It's, it's just staggering. And there's that kitchen, the kitchen on the right there. You walk on, into that kitchen. It's all glass on one side. So it's OK, it's a small galley kitchen. But it is lit up. And it just feels like, because you can walk all the way around everything, it feels fairly large. I love the at-home office. He was an architect. There's his at-home office in one of the rooms. The yellow tracing paper on the walls, the next designs, the drafting table. How painful does that stool look? Yeah. And the T-square on the wall still. And there's that bedroom. Look at that. The glass goes right down to the floor. And you know it drops off there. And you know you're seeing far into the woods. So, but there's his second house. What happened? That core is, is, is now, now the whole center is that big center room. Almost remindful of that uh, house you saw in Germany there, right? There's a center core room, very symmetrically laid out. How would you add on to this house? And you know what? It's been added on to. What they did is a hyphen to another addition. You couldn't, you couldn't, even he tried to do additions onto this, he couldn't figure it out. But look at the elevation there. Doors right in the middle. And what year are we? I didn't give the year on this, but it's early, it's mid 50s, mid 50s. And it had a, how many modern houses have wraparound porches? <laughs> look at, there's a porch going all the way around this house with columns. You can almost describe it like a classical house. Oh, it's symmetrical and it's got a wraparound porch with columns. Look at the, the way that center part is pulled, and you have this wonderful transom window that wraps around. And it's great, huge spaces, really. But you, you feel so connected to the outdoors there. And don't you just love this shot? <laughs> he, doesn't dare go, he doesn't dare go in the kitchen. <laughs> um, and so he's getting clients to do this kind of work too, right? Look at this house. See those white bars? See this, the front door, of course, right in the middle, right? And these two white bars, but see how they kind of float? They don't even seem to touch the ground there. Those white bars are bookcases. You walk in the house, that, that's, a, that's a piece of plywood between you and the outdoors. And on the, and on the right there, you see this, this kind of a slatted, addition there. He's got wooden slats. There's wooden slats and then a plastic material that lets the light through. That's the wall. <laughs> he did some of these sketches too. But look at the plan. It's kind of, okay, it's symmetrical. Doors in the middle. But it's not, right? Because all the bedrooms are weighted in one side and the, and, the, and the living room on the right side. So he's really pushing for that symmetry. You see the bookcases right there. And here's uh, the De Silver house. I should have a label on that. Uh, but again, there's a columns wrapping around the house. You take this bridge to the, to the, to the middle of the house. I love this shot of a, of a modern day house tour going on. The three floating uh, orb lights right there, of course, hanging from the house. And then uh, this is the day house of, I think, about 61 maybe. Um, obviously a much richer, there we go, 66, there's a, there's a much richer material palette going on here. Um, you know, a lot of brick and, and tile and stone. But door right in the middle, yeah. This can you walk through this courtyard and there's this grand procession right up through. So what happened? Why did they do that? Kind of a fun thing. So, here's another book. So, I thought, oh yeah, Robert Venturi, he talked about houses being, or buildings being, not just one thing. 
because you know the, the the modernist had this idea of of total design, total design. Any part of the building should match the rest of the building. It's in its DNA. You should be able to take any one part and kind of understand the building in its entirety. Venturi is saying no. It doesn't have to be just one thing. It can be this and that. And doesn't that make it much richer? Doesn't that make it much more interesting? And isn't that much more reflective of life as we know it? Life is complicated. And shouldn't our buildings reflect the, the complexity in, involved in our life? And so I had to go back and look, oh, maybe, maybe he was talking about what they were doing. So if what they're doing in the 50s, he was talking about in the 60s, maybe they were ahead of their time, okay? But I went back and read it again. You know, Venturi was really talking about the individual parts, really. How, how a column uh, cannot, is more than just a pilote. It's more than just a uh, support. It can also be decorative. So things can do multiple things. And he didn't really talk about, oh, things can be modern and classical. He wasn't going that way. So I'm kind of borrowing part of his philosophy, but he didn't talk about that specifically. He talked more about the components of a building and how, how they have dual meanings. So they were kind of on that trail. Actually, the very first images he shows in his book are two buildings in New Canaan. Right, the Wiley House and the Glass House we just saw. And he doesn't review them very favorably, these modern buildings. <laughs> so, although he doesn't like UVA either. <laughs> what, he, what he likes is this. And he actually later writes a book, right, learning, learning from Las Vegas. And how Las Vegas was just almost okay. It was almost okay, that kind of, chaotic combination of things. It was more real. It was more real. So they were sort of onto that path, but the, the, this, is, this is really the book, whoops, I don't know how they cut, cut off there. Um, this um, was a book that got me hooked, really. Um, and yes, my, the title of my book is a little bit of a steal from this, too. Five Architects in New York. And, cut off uh, Charles Gwathney and Robert Siegel here, but um, what they do, they were taking these forms, very pure forms, but they were just playing. It's, it was architecture for architecture's sake. And he would, Eisenman would start with a, with a cube and then cut it up and then turn the pieces and then dice it up again. Oh yeah, it happens to be a building too. And, and so he actually has some houses in Connecticut that were built and they were called aggressively unfunctional houses. <laughs> and so, New Canaan wasn't doing that, right? New Canaan wasn't doing that. These guys were recognizing that architecture could be just looked at just as art in a way and appreciated just as art. So that was an idea that hadn't come yet. And their, and their buildings sometimes were beautiful just to be beautiful, you know. And, and, and nothing wrong with that, maybe. But so this, the, you know, the, the, the New York Five were kind of the beginnings of a, a postmodern way of looking at architecture. Um, this is 1981, I believe, uh, the book came out. Um, but re what really, uh, uh, and here's one of these, these, these homes. Even the style of drawing, this kind of axonometric style of drawing, it looked computer generated, but it was all drawn by hand then. Um, these kind of perfect ge geometric shapes, which we saw some inkling of that in New Canaan, of taking a uh, shape, these uh, Johansson's square houses and just playing with them, the insides. So there's some, some thought of that. But 1979, this is, you know, when you were on the, if anything's in the cover of Time Magazine, right, that was considered the apex, but also the beginning of the descent, <laughs> right? It was like, you wanted to get on the cover, but then it was almost a bad thing to get in the cover too. But 
he, he's holding like the, the like, like Moses is holding the tablets, right? He's holding a, the, the AT&T building. The AT&T building is just taking a historic motif, the Chippendale top, and just, and just completely stealing something. And so there was some of that too. You know, Kano people were also just taking some history and just, just running with it. So were, my question to myself that I was trying to resolve on these, where do they fit in that arc of history? They certainly leapt off from the, the 1933 book, The International Style. Their first couple buildings certainly were in tune with that, but then they turned. They turned after the glass house. You see this more embrace of, of history. And so they were between, they were between, right? But they're between the international style and they're between the, the New York Five and, their, and Robert Venturi's uh, thoughts and, and pure postmodernism. I can't help but get a plug in here. Uh, this is a documentary uh, that's, that's in the works. Uh, it's being done by um, Devin Shivas. She's a, a movie producer. She's actually at Modernism Week now in, in, in Palm Springs. Um, so if you go to the Harvard Five, you see where she's starting to work on this, on this documentary. And that's me, and that's it. Any questions? I'm just curious what the current state of preservation is of these houses and whether there still is greatly at risk. Um, or is there a new, thanks to your book, is there a new appreciation for their significance? The book was a boon to real estate agents. <laughs> it gave validity to the homes. I actually heard, heard someone say in passing, I'm going to buy one of those houses in your book. That, that was the thinking. It gave it some validity to the houses. But you know, there's a big variety, such a big variety of homes we just covered, right? Some were very modest. Some that were, were a very, had, had very modest budgets when they were originally built, and here they are now 60, 70 years later. And they, if they haven't been maintained, if their property is very valuable, they're going to go. They're going to go. And, you know, I had this discussion with uh, John Johansson. A lot of his houses were being torn down. His simple little square houses were on sometimes very nice pieces of property. They were getting older. The residents were getting older. They wanted to leave. And the houses were getting torn down. And so I met him. He was living up in uh, Millbrook, New York, in this amazing tower he had designed for himself out of corrugated plastic and steel and things. And I said, what if I told you I, I, I met uh, this young couple in New Canaan, and they're going to buy one of your houses, and they're going to uh, you know, tear it down. And he said, oh, it's, it's, it's awful. It's like, it's like losing a child. You don't understand it. You know, he went on and on. And I said, yes, but what if I told you they want to hire you to design a new house? He said, oh, well, that, that, that's a different story. You know? <laughs> so I, I, I think that, that really did encapsulate part of the thinking. Was, it was in the doing. You know? For them, it was like it, 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 they built it, and they got it done, and that's great. And it, it, it was of its time and maybe something else should be built of its time. So it wasn't a matter of, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if the, if, if, the, if the modern architects would be upset to see some of their work go as long as, it's what replaces it is often is, is a bigger issue, I, I think. You know, they, that that spirit has been lost. Uh, and and look, look, some of the homes are, were very well built and, uh, and they had higher budgets or some had chal challenging sites. There, some will be saved that way. The, the Gore's own house that I'm working on now, uh, they've uh, uh, put easements on it themselves uh, that will be administered uh, by the National Trust. It's on the National uh, Register of Historic Places, the building, but that's really honorary. It won't save its life. But they're putting these restri uh, restrictive covenants on the building. So when they know when it goes to sell, there's a limited amount of changes that could be done to the house. That's a pretty severe way to, that's a pretty strong way. The Hodgson house I showed too, that was sold by the, the, the heirs of the house, sold it with restrictive covenants on it just to preserve it. And a sympathetic couple bought it and doing a very you know, sensitive uh, renovation of it, really trying to bring it back to what it was. Uh, again, then there's people policing them in the process. So there's gonna be a variety of history to these. 
and I, you know, some of the ones I have a photograph or a floor plan of, and that's it. There's no more record of these, these homes. Uh, and some are very, very well documented. So the history will be very different for each. Mm. I just can, can, I, can I add on to that, uh, what you were answering? Um, maybe uh, can people hear me without the mic? Uh, I'm, I'm Fred Noyce, in case. Um, let me see here. It, it turns out that there was always a, a, a conflict between the traditionalists and the modernists. Uh, and in, in back uh, when they had the uh, uh, Modern House Day, it was partly about what are these modernists doing? And we don't really like it here because we're a Victorian uh, uh, town. So there's always been a pushback against modernism. But when you had all this sort of mecca of what was happening here on early modern uh, architecture, the town never celebrated it, except for individual uh, architects. That now is changing. There's a new selectman in New Canaan who is trying to figure out what makes New Canaan different from all the other towns around it, Darien, uh, Greenwich, et cetera. And he has the take that, uh, that New Canaan ought to be known as the uh, uh, architectural town, mm. thereby celebrating mm. what, Bill or, uh, Bill, what Bill has been taking you. And mm. needless, needless to say, it is music to my ears, mm. music to everybody else who really watches this, uh, this uh, uh, mid-century modern stuff. You know, so it's really, in a way, the zoning was, was penalizing some of the modern houses. The modern houses tend to be, to be low, right? And, and the, if you looked at a property and wanted to add on to it, for instance, the town looked at lot coverage. They looked straight down. So whether you were one story or two and a half stories was all the same in their eyes, right? So, gee, I want to add on to my house, but I don't want to go up and look like a, 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 a tall colonial or something. I want to go out. No, oh, no, no, it's more coverage. So the town got hip to that, though. The town said, look, bring your projects to us. We'll look at them. It's on a case-by-case -case basis, I believe, but they are open to the idea of being flexible to the modern houses. Well, on that um, more positive note, um, I've been uh, alerted that the reception waits, and there'll be opportunity to talk more at the reception. So I'd like at this point to, to thank Bill so much for uh, illuminating what's really riveting.